Hi, this is Linear Algebra Notes 4.3. We want to try to form a basis for a subspace. And so that's what we're going to try to be looking. Let me give you a quick introduction to this before we get into some of the heavier ideas behind this. So let me take this, push it over here. But if I take a vector, 3, 4, and what I want to do is try to represent that in the form of two base basic vectors what would those basic vectors be a lot of you know this but if i have what i call so if i have e1 hat and e2 hat which means that they are the vectors 1 0 and 0 1 what i can do then is i can take this 3 4 and write it in terms of e1 and e2 using the vectors that I have here, the unit vectors. So I'd end up with that situation right there, okay? So that's a different way to write it. Now what I'm doing is I'm taking the unit vectors and I'm using them as a base to write any vector. And in fact, in R2, I can do that for any vector based upon E1 and E2. So what we can say then is E1 and E2 are a standard basis for R2. I can generate any vector in R2 with these two. What about any other two vectors? Well, if I took two other vectors, say, namely, but what if I have this one, which I call 2, 1, and then I have another one, which I call negative 2, 4. I'm getting a little sloppy here, but it's okay. What if I take those two vectors? Can I generate the 3, 4 from both of those. Well, the mathematics involved with this deal with the inner product and some other things. And so I'm not going to do all that, but I would say, yes, I can get to this point right here using these two vectors. In fact, if you solve this with an augmented matrix, you'd find that C1 is equal to 2 and C2 is equal to 1 half. So twice this, I'm sorry, 1 half this vector. No, I did that wrong twice this vector, and then one half this vector added together will give you your 3, 4. You can double check that math. So that what that means is that these two vectors do form a basis for R2, because I can generate any vector in R2 from these two vectors. But what has to be true about these two vectors? Well, they have to be linearly independent. And so that's the concepts that we're going to be dealing with in both section 4.3 and 4.4. Pretty important. So if I call this one here u and this one here v, then that leaves me with 2u plus 1 half v is equal to 3, 4. Okay? So that's a linear combination gives us that. And so what we have is u and v are basis. For R2. So E1, E2 are a standard basis, and then U and V are a basis if they are linearly independent, two vectors. So a lot of this stuff you've probably seen before, but now it's just in a little bit different form. So let's do theorem four. If we have an index set of many vectors, and we know that we don't have the zero vector in there, then this is linearly dependent if one of those vectors is a linear combination of all the preceding vectors. Okay, that makes sense. We have too many vectors in there, and so that goes over the space, and so then we have linear, linear dependency. Okay? Then that would not form a subspace for us. And so our definition here is that let H be a subspace of vector V, an index set of vectors B in V is a basis for H if... B is a linearly independent set, can't be dependent. And then the subspace spanned by B coincides with H. That is, in other words, H is equal to the span B1 through BP. Can't go over, can't go under. So here, for a basis, if we have a square matrix and it's invertible, the columns will form a basis for Rn because the columns are linearly independent because of the invertibility. 
and that spans Rn by the invertible matrix theorem. So here's the standard basis. This is for more than R2. And we can go like this. Those are all zeros. And so we got E1, E2, all the way up to En. So let's do an example here. Let's just do an example, this one, example number one. So we have these three vectors, v1, v2, and v3. Determine if v1, v2, v3 is a basis for R3. Well, how can we do that? Well, if I take the matrix, 1, 2, 3, negative 2, 1, 0, 4, 2, 1. So the size has to be, should be square for us. These columns have to be linearly independent. And so to do that, I can do the determinant. And if I do the determinant of this, I get negative 19. Since I get a determinant of negative 19, that does tell me that I have a linear independent set of three vectors. And so then this does form a basis. for R3, okay? Now what's another way to do it? Well, if you look down at the bottom of your page, I have this right here. I did reduced row echelon form, and I did get the identity matrix. The identity matrix tells us that we are invertible, all those good things, okay? So that would have been another way to do it. And then example two, well, you can maybe see my work over here that I got. You can do see that you do not get the identity matrix, so therefore then we are uh, not nearly independent, so then we would say no for this one. Determinant of this thing let you do this is not is equal to zero. So not linearly dependent, independent, so not a basis. Also, the determinant, oh, I already said that, but also row reduction doesn't get me to the identity matrix, all those good things, okay? So that's a lot of stuff that we've done before, very similar. Okay, so we have theorem five here. Theorem 5 says that let S be a set of vectors, v1, v, v1 through Vp, be a set in V, and then let H, H be the span of that set. If one of the vectors in S, say V sub K, is a linear combination of the remaining vectors in S, then the set formed by S by removing V sub K still spans H we still span H, and so what we want to do is get as compact as we can, get rid of those ones that are linear combinations of others. So we want the set to be essentially linearly independent, all of them. And then if H doesn't equal to zero, some subset of S is a basis for H. So let's see what vectors we can get rid of to help our cause and to form a basis for what we're looking at. So let's look at example three. Find the basis for the null of A and for the column A for matrix B. Well, since we have uh, a row reduction situation here, the null of A is simply going to be the, it's a set of linear, uh, linearly independent vectors anyways, and so that's just going to form the null space for what we have, okay? And that will be the basis. Now for the column space, we do it a little bit different because remember for the column space from last unit, we tried to solve these out. So we want to find the basis for the null of A. Well, we can take this matrix and then write it out with the free variables. And remember that this and this, these two vectors, turn out to be what can uh, span for us for the null of A. And so those would be the basis for the null of A for what we have. If we look at the column of A, that's a little bit different. Column of A is based upon these B vectors that we do have. So this is B1, B2, B3, B4, B5. 
and we want to get out, rid of the redundancies that we do see. Well, look at B1 and B2, these two right here. If I look at that, isn't one just a multiple of the other? Sure, so what we have is B1 is equal to, or I should say four B1s is, are equal to B2. Now, can we do that with anything else? Well, if I look at this one right here, and what I'm doing is dealing with the ones that set up that don't have a pivot. I want to solve for those somehow. So I solve for the B2. The B2 does not have a pivot in it. B1 does. And so if I set this up, B2 is equal to 4B1. And then I go to the next one that doesn't have a pivot. That would be this column right here. And so when I look at that, that would be in terms of B1 and B2. So I have then B4 is equal to two B1s plus, and if I use this negative one here, would be negative one B3. And obviously B5 is just equal to B5. And then B1 is equal to B1, B3 is equal to B3. That's kind of trivial writing that out, but that, what that means is that these all have the pivot. And when we have the pivot, they are going to be important to us. When they don't have the pivot, what's happening is that we can write a linear combination of that vector in terms of the other vectors in the set. In other words, both of these will be excess. They won't help us span our set for the column of A, and so what we do is we just get rid of them. So what we're looking at then are B1, B2, and B3. Five, I'm sorry, B3 and B5 would be the three vectors that we're going to be using to span the column of A, which then would also form the basis for us. Well, B1 is 1, 0, 0, 0, because that's just my first column. Then my B3 is this one, 0, 1, 0, 0. And then my B5 is going to be the last one, zero, zero, one, zero. This would form the basis for the column vectors that we do have. In other words, I can generate any columns in that space based upon these vectors right here, as I did with B2 and B3. They're generated off of B1 and B3 and B5, but we didn't use B5. So thus we have the basis for the null of A would be this vector and this vector. And by our definition that we did in the last unit, those are linearly independent. So yes, that would form a basis for us. And then we have the basis for the column of A, which would be these three vectors here. Get rid of the excess. Okay, example number four. Why don't you look at these three sets and do they form a basis for R3? Try it first, pause, and see what we come up with. So what we end up here with is that this matrix right here, we get a determinant of negative 17. Oh, would it form a basis then? Yes, that means that they're linearly independent. Therefore, these three vectors would form a basis for R3. If the determinant was zero, well, then it wouldn't be because we would have some vectors that could be written in terms of the other vectors that are in there, linear combination of them. Uh, this one, there's two view, too few. So we want to you know, generate everything in R3. If I have two vectors, I can't do that. And then this one, we would have too many because then I have excess. Now, how many excess do I have? I don't know. It might be one, might be two. I'd have to do some analysis on that. But right now, with these four vectors, they would not form a basis for R3 in the present form because we do have all four. We only need three vectors for R3. Could we maybe break it down to three? Sure, and get rid of one? Yes, but when I just ask the question as it is, this one does not form a basis for R3. So when we're looking at these things, we have to look at this idea. Thus, a basis is a spanning set that is as small as possible. R3, I need three vectors. And a basis is also linearly a linearly independent set that is as large as possible. So you gotta get it up to however big it, it, it can be. So you have to cover all your bases without covering too many. I guess that's the easiest way to say that. All right, here's your gift. 
Why don't you try those problems and then see how this goes. Thanks very much for listening. Have a great day.